I'm Anna Trienda Felidu. I'm a professor at the Global Governance Program and responsible for the Cultural Pluralism Research Area. I'm very pleased to welcome you at this first of this new series of GGP debates. Um, we are very happy to inaugurate in a different type of debate um, where we do them what is called Oxford style. As you know, you all voted when you came in, so the idea is you vote, you express your opinion on a motion um, that is a topic of the debate, then you listen to the debate between two distinguished um, speakers, and then you vote again before finishing so we can measure, so to speak, the influence, we can measure who won and who lost in terms of influence. Of course, sometimes you find that people voted a lot for don't know, and then when they go out, they vote less for don't know, or the contrary. They are very uh, decided on what their view is, and after the debate, they get really um, you know, confused because they see the pros and cons more clearly of one motion towards another. Um, anyway, I'm very pleased to, to welcome here Ben Hammersley, who is our Robert Schumann Fellow. He's a writer and an IT expert. Um, very well traveled and very transnational and very internet based. And then we have the two um, speakers who are in favor or against our motion Kirsten Taylor from Al Jazeera in New York. I'm very pleased that, Kirsten, you have traveled 4,000 miles really <laughs> to be here with us today. Um, and then Martin Scheinin, my colleague, who is a professor of international law and human rights. Um, we have uh, actually, we initially wanted uh, to, to use a motion that was very provocative, but perhaps untenable. The state should censor the internet, but uh, we have made, made it a bit more, um, uh, how can I say, uh, specific and realistic, so this, the state should apply content-based restrictions on the internet. Um, I'll give the floor now to Ben, who has the difficult task of orchestrating a rather uh, hot debate. Um, and naturally, of course, we very, I mean, you explain the procedure and your participation, your really, you know, active participation is very much expected. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Okay, so as has just been said, good hello to everybody on the live stream as well. We're being live streamed to the internet, so if anybody here in the audience isn't meant to be here, don't ask a question, okay? Very important. So the first thing that's going to happen is... Um, we're going to have the, the arguments for and against. Our speakers will speak for 10 minutes each. And then we will go out to uh, questions and discussion from you guys on the floor. I will then ask some questions as well, because I'm in charge of the biggest microphone. And then we will have a summing up, a minute or two from each of the speakers. And then you will vote again. And we will see exactly how the voting has changed. I hope that's all extremely clear. I believe I'm going to be given now, hopefully. Currently, currently, the voting is that maybe is winning, which is a, you know, you, we can tell we're in an academic situation here. Maybe. I must think about it some more. Hopefully, in about an hour's time, you'll have a much stronger opinion either for the motion or against the motion. And like I say, as has been said already, the motion is the state must apply content-based restrictions on the internet. To speak for 10 minutes until the magical machine from Apple tells him to be quiet. Ladies and gentlemen, Martin. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to defend the view that the state must impose content-based restrictions on the internet. I'd like to start by quoting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 19 on freedom of expression. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Later on, as we know, this principle of freedom of expression has been codified into treaty form, the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 10, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 19, and from the human rights treaty provisions, we know that freedom of expression comes with responsibilities, restrictions uh, prescribed by law and necessary in a democratic society are allowed on multiple grounds, including uh, 
national security or rights of others as two extreme grounds on which limitations of freedom of expression are permissible. Then there's another category of sources of international law that actually say states must impose restrictions on freedom of expression. The Racial Discrimination Convention, the Council of Europe Terrorism Prevention Convention, and United Security Council Resolution 1624 say states must pr prevent and punish uh, incitement to racial discrimination, incitement to uh, hatred and violence, and incitement to terrorism. That said, beyond the permissible limitations and the mandatory restrictions, uh, there is a core area of freedom of expression which must not be subject to any restrictions, not even during a state of emergency. And I suggest that these inviolable dimensions of freedom of expression include First, the prohibition against advanced administrative censorship. Administrative authorities controlling before publication what is going to be published. That is unacceptable. And that's what I want to contrast with content-based restrictions that are applied ex post facto by the judiciary, uh, invited by the prosecution, or a civil party through criminal and civil liability imposed by a court on the basis of content-related restrictions of what is uh, not permissible exercise of freedom of expression. The second dimension of the inviolable core of freedom of expression is the prohibition against confiscation of physical media, again, without a lawful order by a court, such as uh, burning of books, confiscation of journals uh, that have been printed but not yet distributed. Thirdly, it's a non-negotiable part of freedom of expression that it must be media neutral, as the Universal Declaration said, through any media. So a state cannot pick and choose, according to the media, what kind of expression is tolerated and what is not. Uh, it must extend from printed books to broadcast over radio or TV and to the internet. And finally, within the inviolable core, I would also include, as freedom of expression is a liberty, is a freedom, you choose yourself what type of expressions you wish to convey, political, artistic, religious, even commercial. It's for the author to choose what kind of expression he or she wishes to convey. Now we go to uh, the method of restriction freedom of expression. And I uh, want to refer to the first Freedom of Expression Act, which was enacted in Sweden, 1766, but written by a Finnish priest, Finland is my nationality, Anders Chudenius. And in a creative and innovative and ingenious way, that bill uh, that was uh, enacted into law in 1766 protected the inviolable core of freedom of expression as part of the then Swedish Enlightenment. Advanced censorship by administrative authorities was prohibited and replaced by content-based restrictions. You couldn't criticize God and religion, king and the royal family, and the estates of Sweden. That's pretty old-fashioned. But the idea was content-based limitations instead of administrative censorship to be imposed through courts by uh, criminal prosecution and fines upon those who engaged in intolerable forms of expression. And the second major innovation was the introduction of a chain of responsibility. The author was to be held responsible, criminally liable for what he wrote and published, or if the author was anonymous, it was the publisher. And when the material was imported, it was the importer or the bookshop. So always there was a, a chain of responsibility. Somebody was held to account on the basis of the content of the printed material. In subsequent centuries, this model was then gradually adopted in the laws of many countries. And in the 1950s, when we got radio and television, it was introduced also to broadcasting in the sense that each program has a responsible editor who is, if necessary, taken to court and punished for expressions that violate the regulated content-based limits. 
What's the challenge today is that this model of a chain of liability is inadequate uh, in respect to modern forms of global electronic communication. There is no regulated chain of responsibility allowing for ex post facto content-based liability. There is a general sense of lawlessness or a legal vacuum in relation to expressions, expressions uh, conveyed uh, via the internet. And that has created a huge market for bad faith responses by government. One response is going after the user, the reader, penalizing those who utilize the resources available on the internet, for instance, for mere possession of uh, prohibited materials. Another is invasive, massive electronic surveillance, resulting in total disregard of the right to privacy, and both a chilling effect and outright violations of freedom of expression, as we see in the United Kingdom as we speak at this very moment. Uh, my view is that there should be an internationally agreed or harmonized understanding of the permissible limits of expression also over the internet. And if there is sufficiently wide international consensus on the basis of the Racial Discrimination Convention and the prohibition of incitement to terrorism, then we can trust each country, each state to impose the uh, restrictions through court procedures in the country of origin, in the country where the posting on the internet happened. And therefore, we don't have to go after the uh, fiber optic cables or the users. It's sufficient to hold to account the author, or if, if the author was anonymous, the person who posted on the internet the offending material. And again, content-based restrictions is the proper answer instead of going after a media or going uh, back to the days of censorship by administrative authorities or confiscation of physical materials such as hard disks, as is done by the UK today. Thank you very much. Thank you. One minute 45 remaining. Okay. Will he regret having that extra time to make his point when faced with our speaker against the motion? Ladies and gentlemen, Kristen Taylor. Thank you. Hello, Internet. Um, so, so two big things that I want to talk about. Um, one is that there's really a lack of sophistication um, when any sort of content filtering is, is applied right now online. And the second is the importance of an informed citizenry. Um, so I'll come back to both of those points. Um, we have this expression online, and we talk about the ban hammer no relation to this gentleman sitting next to me. Uh, but the ban hammer being something that is a tool that a moderator online would be able to use um, when someone has done something with malicious intent um, or is trolling in some way, um, you're able to use the ban hammer. But it's done judiciously. Um, and, and part of what I think is so, so harmful about this idea is the fact that it's often uh, online never done judiciously, but done in a very, very broad and sweeping way. Um, in Pakistan, lately, um, the, uh, the Shia and the Sunni on November 15th and 22nd um, have had a number of clashes, and the government is blaming social media for those. Um, and the top newspaper there, The Dawn, published something very interesting right before those started on the 15th, and they said, actually, it's really the sectarian militants uh, that you might want to, to be watching more closely online, um, because in, in this sense, they were sort of the trolls, right? So there often isn't a level of nuance, um, and that's, that's quite important that it's missing. Um, the other is uh, geo-blocking, which we see happen quite a bit online. Um, and geo-blocking does not account for populations that move. Um, it says that instead of doing something where you might be able to be a subscriber to information and you would be able to carry that information with you, instead it's just going to block out from a geospatial perspective. And that also is, uh, feels uh, not interesting um, and, and really sort of behind in, in many ways. And that, that's how both are, are implemented. Um, Tunisia has a new, uh, a new privacy um, agency. It's called A2T. Um, it replaces the ATI. Um, and what they've done is they've just sort of set it up by decree. 
uh, with no, no input from the citizens. Um, and then they've decided that they're going to have a follow-up committee. And the same person who runs the A2T is running the follow-up committee. Um, so it's sort of interesting to watch how uh, we've gone back in history, but now in the current moment, um, when we see these surveillance uh, agencies begin to be set up, how they're often not done in any way that takes into account what the citizenry uh, might be thinking about or concerned about. So, so they're always sort of based on fear, uh, which is a problem. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about steganography one of my favorite words. Um, and the classic definition of steganography um, is this idea that you have a bald soldier and you tattoo something on the soldier's head and then the hair grows in and they take off with the message for the next town. So the difference between steganography and cryptography is that with crypto cryptography, you realize that it's a message and that it's encrypted, but with steganography, you don't know that it's actually a message, right? Um, unless you shave that guy's head and you know to do that. Um, so what we see online is this idea that all of us have an audience um, and that we're all doing social steganography all of the time. Um, and part of the reasons that, that we're doing it is to get around things like content-based filtering. Um, so Sino Weibo, uh, which is China's Twitter, has 500 regist million registered users and about 54 million users every day. Um, and as far as uh, really developed and sophisticated and sort of nuanced way of content filtering, um, they're sort of it. Um, and they're in fact so good at it that everyone realizes that there are many ways to go back and sort of collect the information that's been censored. Um, so one way is with something that's called the Weibo scope. Um, and that creates a backup of all the information that was deleted during a given day on the service. Um, so then that becomes available. It's a searchable archive, which is quite important um, to go back. Um, there's something called the 50 cent party. Uh, and these are, th that's how the government employees, hundreds of thousands of them, are referred to who in fact go in and post fake comments and things um, so that the pro-government side will ultimately win. Um, they're, they're a little bit schizophrenic. Um, and then we have something that's developed called Long Weibo, right? Um, so Weibo, like Twitter, only has 140 characters. But since it's in Chinese, every character could be a word. Uh, some people don't feel that that's quite long enough. Um, so they have these programs that compress the text into an image. So you can have larger than 140 characters and you post that image. Once the image is up, then that information is traveling outside of the filters. Um, so those are ways that people are getting around Weibo. Um, and ProPublica has a, has a wonderful new project called the Memory Hole, um, where they're actually going in and looking at all of these different types of censored images and they're trying to categorize them. Um, and what's very interesting about that, of course, is that even this very sophisticated content filtering mechanism and machine and algorithm um, has so much attention drawn to it that all of the censored material, in fact, has a second wave of attention, right? It has an even longer life than it might have in the most ephemeral form that it was in. Um, and maybe later we can get into some other examples of this. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about things that are meant to degrade instantly, like Snapchat, um, and then also about networks that, uh, that you can create the content in and then also post it, right? So filtering within the network itself. Um, another thing that happens uh, on the internet in China uh, is that there are zombie armies of accounts that spring up um, and what they do is something called hashtag jacking, right? Um, so it becomes even more important in these types of situations to go back, to fall back on networks of trust um, because so quickly are the hashtags polluted by these hundreds of thousands of fake accounts that they jump to new tags and then just to users, uh, friends and influentials that they know. Um, but what also happens with this content filtering mechanism is that uh, the government is looking especially at influential Twitter users, so people with above uh, 10 or 50,000 followers. Um, and in fact, they're ignoring things that happen at the grassroots level. Um, often locally in, in small places, similar things are happening. And those are not uh, sort of making their way back up. So it doesn't even work. Um, in Benedict Anderson's uh, seminal text, Imagine Communities, um, he talks about the horizontal feeling that people within a given community um, often in nation state, feel for each other, even for people that they haven't met. Um, and so 
when we think about these shared experiences that all of us have now, uh, the idea that all of us would be struggling against a content filtering mechanism is another way that might bond us together, in fact, um, even more tightly than we might otherwise be bonded uh, because we're suffering through something similar together, content filtering. Um, so a few years ago, um, James Fowler and Nicholas Christakis did some research you may have heard about. Um, in a book called Connected, they talk about their research uh, which showed that, in fact, your Facebook's fr your friends' friends on Facebook might be making you fat. It's important knowledge um, to know, and um, and part of what that means, of course, is that our networks influences influence us in ways that we don't even realize, right? So there's an indirect um, correlation on our behavior from people who are further out than just the people that we actually know and are most closely tied to. Um, and this is quite important, I think, when we're talking about what it means um, to do content-based filtering, um, because part of the things that are influencing us are things that we might not even be seeing, but our friends are, right, and, and their friends are seeing. It doesn't work once you get about four, um, four layers out in the onion. Um, something else that they talk about, and, and we can talk about this later, is the self-annealing behavior within networks, which means that actually a network can heal itself. Um, and this is another reason why content-based filtering um, ultimately sort of falls down, is because within a network, it's like a bucket brigade, and if somebody falls out, the network just heals around that, and it keeps going, and it keeps passing the information. Um, so the other way to look, so the alternative, how much time do I have? Okay. Um, so the alter one of the alternatives to content-based restrictions is this idea of collaborative filtering. So within music services, we know this very well, in a content-based filter service, you set up your preferences and then it becomes more and more perfect. You keep honing the algorithm, uh, the service. In collaborative type services, it will show you some music that overlaps with your friends, therefore you get random content that you might otherwise never see or get. That means that in fact your network is much wilder and wider, um, also that it's not homophily, it's not just the same thing that you might always see, and I think it tells us something truly important about um, the predictive uh, possible futures that we could have with a collaborative filtering system and not with a content base that's totally based on the past and the old ways. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the two arguments, the more legal argument from the lawyer in the corner and the more technological and social argument from the technology and social person over here, <laughs> quite fittingly. One question to Professor Scheinen. Um, I think that the general structure of the argument is pretty convincing, meaning we've got two choices because the freedom of speech is not unrestricted, sometimes it has to be restricted, sometimes we want it to be restricted, and we can either censor the net, meaning we act ex ante, and that's the bad way, or we can do it the good way, meaning we can limit content ex post based on, on, on this idea we build when it comes to restrictions of freedom of expression. And thanks to that, because the chain of liability is already outdated, we can punish the reader, uh, not, not the reader, but we can punish the author or the person who posted it, and thanks to that, we are not punishing the reader, meaning the users, and we can avoid the surveillance. So actually, by limiting content, by, by imposing content-based restrictions, we, we achieve the goal of having the free net. But my Good question, summary. Thank you. Good summary. My question is, because this sounds too convincing, the question is, how do we, after all, know who posted it? Because as long as, an, as I have official account with my surname and I post something, as it happens, for example, if I'm an author in a newspaper, the case is clear, but as long as someone does not sign his name or even maybe pretends to be someone else, we do need to get to him. And of course, we know how to trace it, we know how to trace IP address and stuff, but this, again, ends up in surveillance. Because the more sophisticated methods that people use to hide themselves, the more sophisticated methods of getting to them we need. And then we end up having Big Brother and a lot of small sisters out there. So 
how do you think we should get the knowledge on who did it so that we don't end up with really having censorship and surveillance and the right to privacy violated? Thank you. The, the simple answer is that um, already now we know which computer did it. It's always traceable what was the computer that was used for posting that material on the internet. And then we are held to account for the use of our computers and also when we allow other people to use them for criminal purposes. And in the end, it will be for the prosecutor to prove beyond reasonable doubt that it was me who either did it myself or allowed somebody else to use my computer for a criminal purpose. That, that's the simple model. We have seen a great change about how we control the identity of people going to the internet. Also here in Italy, when I came a couple of years ago, they always wanted to see my passport and take a photocopy of my passport as a condition for using the internet. Now we have got rid of that so that it's simply the fact that the computer is traceable, that which is generally sufficient for um, making sure that in the extreme case of criminal prosecution, you will find the person who did it. It's not 100% safe, but it's not either 100% safe in the traditional field, field of printed material, because of course you can have uh, secretly printed publications and you would need the same methods of crime in investigation to find out where it, where it was printed and by whom. So it's, it's, it's not a categorical difference compared to traditional means of expression. It's just as, a as technological the, evolution. As the chairman, I'm, it's not my uh, privilege to, to give an opinion on anything here, but I must ask you a technical question. What you just said is not true at all, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Technically speaking, I mean, I could show you, as could any 13-year-old, an infinite number of ways of posting anonymously to the internet that, that mean that it's untraceable. The US uh, Navy invented a thing called Tor, which is untraceable and is freely available to anybody. Um, everybody here is using a v EUI VPN, which means that anything that they post from anywhere around the world looks as if it came from the EUI, but VPNs are freely available and that destroys that. Uh, you have encryption. You also have um, public, uh, publication systems which are specifically designed to be anonymous in the first place. So what you just said, uh, uh, and again, not to give an opinion, but what you just said is entirely wrong. It's not entirely wrong. That's extreme. Well, it, it's, it's wrong enough I'm, I'm, to I'm make your point invalid. No. Which is wrong enough. It's, it's wrong enough to pose a challenge to the prosecutor to prove his case. Okay. In that case. Uh, do we have another question specifically for Chris? Unless, oh, Christine, would you care to come in on that point? Well, I mean, yes. It, you know, of, of course everyone's posting anonymously all of the time. Um, and, and also, most people have multiple accounts on various services. So, um, you know, mobile data is, uh, you know, infamously insecure at the moment. Um, but, you know, some of the things, and I, I sort of alluded to this, um, some of the newest services are, are, are meant to degrade instantly, right? You send someone a Snapchat, and once that one-to-one -one communication has happened, then the, th the thing is gone, the content has disappeared, and that's the whole purpose of the thing itself, right? Um, and you find out if someone has taken a screenshot of that content when it's happened. Um, so, so in fact, you, you want it to disappear, just as you might disappear in, in any service. So, um, yes, so. Anna at the back there. Um, I have a question actually, to, a bit more to Kirsten, but actually to both. I want to ask you to get the, the debate a level lower, closer to reality. Too much technological sophistication, too much legal expertise. Um, I want to give an example. Uh, you probably remember in 2006 the whole controversy about the Muhammad cartoons published in a Danish newspaper that were particularly offending of um, Muslim uh, people. Now, on that case, the cartoons were published in a newspaper, and actually, although today you can find them on the internet, their uh, diffusion was, not, uh, was neither immediate nor automatic because they were on paper. Um, there was a big 
debate about it, there was even social unrest, there was conflict, there were problems in diplomatic relations, and then there were newspapers with differing views across Europe, some republished the cartoons and others didn't. Um, and some actually uh, did not republish, um, interestingly most, um, I think in Britain, no newspaper, no newspaper published the cartoons because they said, this is exactly a proof of our responsibility. It's not a matter of not expressing my opinion about Muslims or about Muhammad. It's a matter of expressing it in a way that is not offensive to people's religious beliefs. And we know that religious beliefs are beyond rationality. So it's not a question of whether it is right or wrong, false or true. So the question for me is, I give this example is, what is more precious for us? For me, it's not about sanctioning the author who designed the cartoons, who wrote something offensive about the Roman, the Muslims, or indeed the Greeks. I'm Greek. <laughs> the question is, what is more important? Um, you know, uh, defending the, the, the freedom of expression at any cost, or indeed, um, you know, pre preventing, protecting some people who are often vulnerable people. They can be minorities, they can be immigrants, asylum seekers, they can be minors you know, from being exposed to some, um, something that really offends them, offends their beliefs or offends their very existence, or safeguard uh, somehow absolute and really, um, you know, quite theoretical right to freedom of expression whatsoever. Because what I want to tell you, Kirsten, it's not about China. We're not advocating here that we should all, we should all become China. The question is really, uh, you know, a moral and a political question what is better, absolute freedom of expression or indeed, um, you know, imposing some level of responsibility even to those who are not able to, to uphold this responsibility? Because it would be nice to assume that everybody would be like, um, you know, a British newspaper, of course this is my, my personal view, and prevent themselves from offending a certain category of people and actually preventing social unrest and political conflict and having a more, in my view, political but also civilized exchange of, of, of viewpoints or is it that we should, you know, everything goes, you know. Right. Well, I mean, I, I don't think my argument is that, that everything goes. Um, before I was at Jazeera, I worked at the Huffington Post, um, which has quite an online audience. Um, and, and we used to, you know, and, and they still do, really have conversations around things like tagging. Um, because when a school shooting tragedy happens, um, as has happened in the US, um, and articles are published, then all of a sudden, all of the top result, uh, search results for that place often are linked to that tragedy, right? Um, so in fact, you sort of own the search term page um, with that place um, with these, these, these terrible and uh, disturbing articles. Um, the, the real point is that the citizenry needs to be informed, right? So if you're not republishing the offensive visual imagery itself, then the reader needs to understand what, in fact, that was about um, so that they can make their own informed decision. I think that's responsible uh, journalism. I think Anna's dichotomy is false in the sense that it's not a choice between freedom and responsibility, but responsibility grows from freedom. By protecting in an absolute way freedom of expression, we create the sense of responsibility. And those are matters of editorial choice about self-regulation by the media. And it, it, it's best done in an ethical and socially responsible way when the state takes a hands-off approach and says, we'll guard what's criminal, but that's the only thing we will do, and the rest is for the media themselves to take care of, in including sensitivities that, that go, go beyond actual incitement to crime. Just to, we're going to go through another question at the back there, but just to follow up on your, your answer there, you, you raise the, um, an interesting question about when we're talking about content-based censorship, who is it who decides what that content is that gets censored? Okay, you are using the word censorship, which oh, is sorry, sorry. Well, very, very wrong. Res restriction, content-based restriction. Content-based restrictions are So, so what content is restricted? Ultimately applied by a court of law on the basis of a legal text which defines the categories of uh, expression that amount to a crime. The challenge here is that 
those definitions must cover also symbolic forms of expression. So many countries criminalize Holocaust denial, not because lying is made into a crime, but because Holocaust denial today constitutes a form of incitement. Likewise, uh, Nazi swastika is a very powerful symbol which has an incitement content, incitement to hatred, incitement to violence as the message. And ultimately, the prosecutor would need to prove to the court that indeed there was an intent to incite to hatred and discrimination behind the publication of a Nazi swastika. It's not simply the words used, but the context which then covers also symbolic speech. And I do, I'm not saying it's an easy task, but I'm still saying it should be left to the prosecutor to prove and the court then to accept. Can I move you back here? No, you can't. At the back there. Just a few questions for both parties at the risk of disagreeing with everybody in the room. Um, on Martin's side, I was wondering specifically, um, why do you think that despite the wonderful human rights law and the principles you've discussed, um, states tend to, in, for the most part, completely ignore them and do whatever they want? Um, I think the last few months and years have shown quite evidently that when restriction of content takes place, it's not by judges, but by large private corporations or by small vassals of various different states. And none of this takes place under the rule of law which you're describing. The other side of that, and it's sort of, I was confused a little bit when the, um, you suggested that the Snapchat, somehow the images are suddenly gone. Of course, they're not gone, they're still on the servers. And so the, the strange thing is that we're sort of having a very academic debate about a theoretical problem when the practical reality of it is that censorship or restriction of freedom of expression happens constantly and everywhere and has massive effects on people's lives. And when the American uh, Pen Association does a survey of its, order, uh, of its members, how they feel, uh, excuse me, a survey of American authors, how they feel about what's happened um, after Snowden, there's an overwhelming response of, we're not sure what to say anymore and we're not sure what we can publish anymore. So there's already self-censorship going on before we've even started. How do you, do you feel that this is somehow, in the context of a black and white debate, are states, do states actually care about freedom of expression in the substantive content? Because they don't seem to act that way. And vice versa on the other side, how do you feel that the, the actual day-to-day -day surveillance impacts people's freedom of expression beyond the specific sort of, it might be there or it might suddenly be disappearing? Okay, let's start with Martin first. Well, the question was why? And I think there are multiple explanations. One of them is that technology, technological development take us by surprise. We regulated the chain of responsibility for printed material. We did it for broadcasting over a limited range of radio waves, but we forgot to do it or we were not able to do it for the internet. It just caught us by surprise and hence there is no clear chain of responsibility, whom, whom to take to court. And that has been sensed by a legal vacuum uh, by governments, and then the intelligence agencies have filled that vacuum by their own self-made law, which is partly based on a state-within-the-state mentality, uh, which actually is disrespect for the existing framework of the law. Another uh, explanation is, even though the uh, universal declaration says any media. I think many states would take the position that internet is not a medium in the meaning of the universal declaration, that it doesn't cover the new forms of expression. It simply relates to um, books, periodicals, printed materials, and broadcasting, but not to internet. And thirdly, many states, including the US and the UK, take wrongly the view that anything that crosses our national border or happens outside our borders is free game for anything we want to do. It will not be an intrusion into human rights if we simply intercept the fiber optic cable which goes under the British Channel across UK and France, and they are wrong. <laughs> they are wrong about the universal nature of human rights and their obligations in relation to each and every person, irrespective of location or nationality. 
But it's an uphill battle, I can tell you. Uh, yes, so, um, right, so as you, you know, point out, um, the Snapchat content does live on a server, right? Um, and that group is, is based in Venice Beach, California. Um, let's hope that the servers aren't near their party house. Um, but, you know, but part of that, really the interesting bit is that it's a user behavior, right? And that's why I was talking about social steganography. Um, we, we've now developed an entire system because all of us have this recognition that, that we all have audiences. And those audiences, those, those multiple mediated publics are talking to each other. Um, and those will exist sort of over time. So we, in fact, filter ourselves in some ways. Um, but I actually think that we do a better job um, and, and actually what uh, should be adopted is this collaborative uh, filtering model if we're going to do it at all. Um, because it, it means that, in fact, we won't just become so internal and so focused on our own little circles and on really kind of compressing it um, until it has very little meaning anymore and until nothing um, can escape this vacuum that we've put it in. Um, and, and I think that the Snapchat behavior and this idea of something uh, degrading instantly uh, has a, a little bit of a feeling of joy and delight and that's what used to be so excellent about so many parts of the internet and that's part of what we lose when we move to a culture of fear with, with filtering and restrictions. Thanks. I would like to ask you <coughs> and, and uh, put a question to Kristen. Mm -hmm. uh, you, when you're in your presentation, uh, you mentioned various uh, kinds uh, of kind of preventing filtering, uh, mm -hmm. but um, um, are you against uh, any kind uh, of uh, regulation of content? So no defamation, uh, no uh, prohibition of child pornography, uh, no uh, prohibition of incitement to terrorism. Uh, should uh, this all be allowed, uh, or uh, are you um, um, only, exclude, only uh, addressing uh, preventing filtering? Uh, and if this is the case, uh, what, is the con well, what is the conflict between the view that was uh, expressed by Martin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question, and, and I really was only talking about filtering. So. I think it's working. So I wanted to emphasize the cross jurisdictional dimension of this uh, question of this uh, debate and probably the question is directed to professor Sinin mostly because it's a it's a legal uh, it's the, the 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 practical problems that um, uh, even an attempt to 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 regulate as you su have suggested is jurisdiction first of all uh, free speech freedom of expression is not uh, thought of uh, uh, fr with the same uh, lawyers from different jurisdictions think of free speech really, really differently. And uh, the example that you, you posed with Nazi memorabilia and um, uh, Holocaust denial, uh, uh, what is legal and what is criminal changes w while you, you cross borders. So um, bringing, th knowing that the internet is a cross-jurisdictional medium by nature, how do you reconcile that and how do you think that it's practical to bring in um, in an international convention that you might think of uh, to, 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 to reach a consensus on what restrictions we place? Well, we have the minimum consensus in the form of the Racial Discrimination Convention and Article 20 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is basically incitement to violence and hatred against other people persons and then we can add incitement to terrorism and nationally you can then apply different um, intermediate steps that may create a presumption let's say holocaust denial in france is taken as a form of incitement to violence but still in order to meet the universal test the prosecutor need to, need, would need to prove that there was an intent to incite to hatred and violence and not simply um, an intent to distribute lies about history. I don't think it is a perfect model, but I'm defending that there is a universal content of freedom of expression and it would be possible to harmonize national laws on the basis of the existing universal standards of what kind of expression should be prohibited. And that's a very small range of exceptions. Alex at the back. Yeah. Uh, just a very brief question to, to all of you. What is clear?
cloud computing doing to all of that? Freedom of speech has its boundaries, and they're dissolving more and more. But technology has also its boundaries, dissolving more and more. You can cut cables under the ocean, but you can shoot at clouds more difficult. So I'm wondering to what extent technology not as advanced too much to even have that debate. Kristen. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, what's really interesting when we think about how content moves um, is is really the fact that so many spaces online are shared. So, uh, you know, just to, to use a very common um, uh, file sharing service, you know, Dropbox folders are often shared between collaborators, you know, up to 10 to 20 people um, from everywhere in the world. So if you were to try and restrict the content that was moving in and out of it, um, everyone, you can set different levels um, of, of admin privileges within that, but, but everyone could be moving the content in and out almost at the same time, the way we used to do uh, with wikis, actually. Um, and, um, and everyone's in a different geographic place in the world. And I think it would be very, very hard to regulate that effectively um, because we don't think of something like a, a cloud computing file sharing service as having any kind of an edit log um, no one says, you know, everybody might be on chat in another screen on their browsers, you know, somewhere else, their computer, and saying, like, I'm going to go grab those files and take them out and do whatever with them um, on your personal server. Uh, but the record isn't in there in the same way, um, being visible to the user. And I, I think that's really key to how we, we think about these shared spaces online, in that we don't see the ownership um, and, and especially, I mean, this gets back to, to what we we're talking about with um, the, the anonymous user um, or the pseudonymous user, right? So, um, so really, like, it's not really about you owning the content. It's much more about the information finding its way to the right person, uh, which is what the internet is really good at, is delivering packets of information. Um, and sort of removing the ego from it and literally your avatar from it uh, means that we have more of a, an idea of what we could do in the future when in fact it's about how to get the thing to the place and not who got it there or how it got there, right? And removing it in, in the timely manner as well. Yeah. Well, my simple answer is the responsibility of the originator. There are thousands of traffic offenses committed in Italy on a daily basis and people are never caught of them. But still there's a risk that one day you will get caught of speeding. The same thing with the internet. The originator is responsible for the content if it crosses the boundaries of criminal law. Question at the beginning. Uh, front here. Thank you. Um, so are the poison is not that far away from the medicine. <laughs> and of course democracy should be lived in a safe net. Of course, we can't guarantee the implementation of uh, and guaranteeing of human rights without um, a sec security, without a security so agenda. And especially now in the post-ACTA period of our times, uh, this agreement that EU had signed, fortunately, the civil society decided that we don't want it. So um, what, what should be the limits of these restrictions of the freedom? And actually, how can we guarantee that social control will not make people unhappy? That's my, that's my question. Thank you. Two questions then. What are the limits? How can we stop people being unhappy because of them? I don't think we can and should stop people from being unhappy. <laughs> that's... Spoken uh, like a law professor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and as to the first one, I think I already answered. The, Limits are narrow, they are based on the criminalization of certain content, and the rest should be free. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would just go back to this, this idea of, um, of how they're setting up the new surveillance agency in Tunisia, um, where it's being done by decree, um, the citizenry does not feel involved in any way. Um, so already there are all sorts of questions as to how they might try to regulate. Um, and even putting someone on that follow-up committee that they've done um, to watch the watchers, as we say, um, really isn't quite enough. Um, so, so I think that, that really most, uh, 
most state agencies aren't thinking about this in a, in a very nuanced way at all. Um, and there's so many different types of users and we all use all of these services differently. Um, and none of the, the current legislation reflects that level of sophistication. You have two more questions between you to make your final cases, then we'll do the summing up and then, actually, we'll do two questions and then the summing up and whilst the summing up is happening, we'll have the, the voting. Another question here at the front. And then, and then we're going to go over I really, there. I really can't understand how you, you, you define the human right. So as you define it, it's, there is a core value of the human right, and there is also another part of the human right that we don't care about. We, we can't protect it. This is what, this is what I, I, I understand. And also, um, I would like to hear from you what these restrictions, these limits are, because I, I, I do not know. I haven't read them. Mm -hmm. That's why. So what are the limits? How the government cannot criminalize every action of my everyday life or my internet-based uh, action. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I defend the view that a human right has an inviolable core, and what's around that core is not something we don't care about. It's an area where we think that permissible limitations are possible, and they must be necessary in a democratic society, they must be prescribed by law, and they may, must meet the test of proportionality. So they must not defeat the right itself. So we do care of that other area as well. But the core, in the case of freedom of expression, is partly institutional, that I see it as the prohibition against advanced censorship by administrative authorities and instead choosing the model of imposing content-based restrictions through prosecution and criminal punishment. So I'm willing to pay that price of a possibility of a criminal punishment. And of course there will be rational arguments to say where, the, where is it appropriate to apply the fist of criminal law. Criminal law is the ultima ratio, the measure of last resort. And it's good to say it's really incitement to violence that it is the ultimate test or matters closely associated to incitement to violence uh, such as racial hatred or terrorism so that we understand that there must be a necessity test at the phase of legislating those limits, and then the judge still must be convinced that this in conduct indeed was so serious that it deserves to be punished with the fist of the criminal law. Yes, and I, I just think, you know, we really, again, we, we have not seen uh, this, you know, the, the human law that we have. Um, used appropriately or correctly, I, I don't think it reflects in any way the this, this state of the internet, the, the true sense of what it feels to be a citizen online. Um, and, you know, and therefore, you know, implementing it at all means that it's, it's horribly behind and it's legislating past behavior in a way that, that does not account for any sort of a future that, that's optimistic um, or hopeful. Uh, we have one minute remaining for both of you to make your closing statements. Martin? Well, the internet is a new medium. It's a widespread universal medium which connects people across continents, across national borders, against class divisions of society. And it's the most democratic medium. We have got rid of the dictatorship of the editor and the publisher. This means that self-regulation doesn't really work. And the uh, appeal to journalistic responsibility doesn't really work. I think we have to be willing to pay for that price and still protect freedom of the internet against intrusions such as massive surveillance and content-based filtering and instead apply the traditional approach of not only defined content-based limitations prescribed in the criminal law and applied through the criminal law process. I hope this will help in educating a new generation of global citizens who will be responsible also when using the internet. We can't trust anybody else. Kristen Taylor. 
So we, we've seen how, how poorly um, the governments and state agencies have been uh, using uh, this legislation um, so far and, and really thinking about how to involve the citizenries uh, globally around um, content uh, filtering. I think that collaborative filtering is, is a much better way to think about what this is and, and also that, in fact, um, with everything that's happened uh, this year, all of us are self-regulating um, all of the time. Um, it's easier than ever to, uh, to monitor our own data. Um, even quantified self-movement does this. Um, but truly thinking about um, how much we, we no longer uh, participate in publicly or share publicly and how locked down uh, many of us are online tells us how, in fact, we are doing our own regulation already and we, in fact, don't need um, any external uh, uh, filtering. Thank you very much, both of our speakers. Thank you all for your questions. As we speak, democracy is happening behind you. The monitors are in place. The men with blue berries are watching with guns drawn as the voting is being counted. The tension in the room is incredibly high. Ladies and gentlemen, um, stick around, have a debate, try not to punch each other. Thank you very much. Good night.